Moving on to our next question, this one is specifically for um, Doreen. Um, can you talk about the process of applying to U.S. colleges as an international student? Specifically, what are some things that everyone in this meeting should know about navigating the process? And is there any advice that you wish that you had from day one when you started applying to schools as an international student? All right, so I have a couple of pointers, just things that I wish I knew from day one as, as, an, as an international student applying to U.S. colleges. And one of them being starting early in literally anything involving in the process. So one, of course, doing your research with, with universities. And for example, in the U.S., there's over like 4,000 universities. So there's a, quite a big range to choose from. So it's really good to see starting your research early. So if early on, you know, I want to apply to a college in, in America. So just seeing what universities are available for you and using online, whether it be online websites or going on the college websites and seeing if they have your major, if they have the programs that you'd like to do. So having some sort of criteria. So like what exactly would you want out of your college experience and seeing if the colleges that you find do match up with what you'd expect to your college experience to be like. So starting early with research. Another thing I'd say is making sure you stick to the deadlines because the deadlines are firm. So if you miss, let's say, your application, then like they won't really like be any room for you to be like, oh, I can submit my application late. So just making sure you stay on um, find a way to keep track of the deadlines and also depending on whether you're applying early or not. So just having those deadlines on track. And let's say something about um, being an international student is that there's so much terminologies in terms of the surrounding and the application process. So for example, early decision, early action, regular decision, need lines, need aware. So there's like so much terminology surrounding the application process. So it's really important to be aware of these. And for example, in Tanzania, there's not much, for example, if you go to um, national curriculum schools, it's not really much support or guidance that's offered to understand what the process really looks like and even help with what the, these terminologies mean. So even taking the initiative to do your online search because the information is really available online. If you do your research online, you can get you know an idea of this. But another addition I'd say is also in terms of the standardized tests, for example, the SATs, ACTs, most of us actually come to learn about these, let's say in your last year of high school, when you're starting to look at the colleges you want to apply to, and you start looking at the requirements and you're like, oh, they need an SAT score. And for many people, they don't really know what's an SAT score. So I'd say if, you, if you're listening to this and you're currently, let's say, you just started high school or in your middle school, just starting to familiarize yourself with what's an SAT score, you know, all these standardized tests and starting the preparation early, you know, step by step, not too much, but like eventually once you reach the stage of applying to college, it would really be helpful because you'd already know what they look like and what to expect when you finally take the test. And also financial aid is another thing as an international student. So understanding what does it look like? What does your college offer and what your family can, you know, can manage to support you with. So understanding the financial aid process really much because it's different um, for international students. So I know for US students, they use um, the FAFSA, I believe, but then for international students, there's something called the CSS profile. So looking at that, what documents do they need? Do you need to, sub to submit in order to, you know, complete your financial aid application? So all these are, you know, things to keep in mind. And lastly, I'd say being open-minded because one thing that people have usually is, there is like quite a big range of great universities in America. So having a diverse list is very important and making sure you, you know, diversify your list is really good. So I hope these are some things that I wish I'd known, you know, before from day one, and I hope they're quite helpful. All right. Amazing. Thank you for that um, question and answer, especially as an international student. I know a lot of people here are tuning in from outside of the U.S., and it is really important that we talk about the resources and the differences in the application process if you are applying from outside. And now moving on to letters of recommendation and the role, the play, and the role that they play in the application process, I will actually start in talking about this just because, one, it's very similar from undergrad and law school, and two, these are just a few things that I wish I had known when I started the process. So essentially, for 
for most schools that you apply to, I'm pretty sure every single one, they will ask for two letters of recommendation. It is really important that the people who are writing these letters of recommendation are someone that you trust, are someone that has seen you do good work in school, and is someone that you know will be able to talk to you in a positive light without you knowing is the biggest part. Oftentimes, you'll get the option, whether you can choose to see what they say about you or whether you deny being able to choose what they see about you. I would 100% recommend that you choose to deny seeing what they say about you. I know that can feel a little hard to just trust someone to write about you, but if you want it to look the best, it if thinking about it from the perspective of an admissions counselor, if they knew that you read what the person wrote about you, they wouldn't take it with that much grain of assault versus if they knew for a fact that you had no idea what this person was saying about you, at least in that essay specifically. You would obviously have fully know it would be a strong letter of recommendation because of your interactions with this professor or this teacher. However, it is still really important that when you ask them that you recognize that you will deny any type of seeing of what's actually being said about you. Something else though that I think is really important is that you don't just have to ask and then give it to them to do anything that you want. You can literally ask if they can write you a letter of recommendation. If they say no, then you will go on to someone else. But if they say yes, you can also send them a bullet point reminders of things that you've done in class. You could give them tips saying, I would like to for you to talk about what it's like to have me as a student. I would like to remember this day that I did this thing in class and, and make sure to include that in my um, essay that you write about me. I think the really the biggest thing about the letters of recommendation is that these are supposed to be what other people think of you when you're not in the room or like when you're not necessarily there to check what they're saying. And that will be able to be communicated the best if you just give them a little bit of guidance and helping shape that. By no means am I saying that you should be writing it for them, but you don't have to also do it the other opposite way of just giving them free reign. And something else that I think is really important is to make sure that you're confident that they can write you a strong letter of recommendation. Don't just simply ask, can you write me a letter of rec? But instead ask, would you be willing to write me a strong letter of recommendation? Then you'll be able to know for a fact that they are talking nothing but positive things about you as a student, you as a worker, or just you and your capacity and to be in undergrad at this new place. So those are just the few tips that I have as it relates to writing a strong letter of recommendation and then passing it back to Doreen to talk a little bit about what that's like from the international student perspective as well. Okay, so I would definitely echo what Raja said about um, having some pointers in, let's say, if you ask someone to write your recommendation letter, having some pointers about yourself so, so that they know, you know, maybe you've done some key things that you're like, I would love this to be my recommendation letter. So just, you know, adding that to whoever is writing your recommendation letter, I'd say that's really helpful. So for example, for us, I remember for our teacher recommendation letters specifically, we had something called a brag sheet. So in there, for example, if something you've done in class, that's really, you believe stood out and you believe that the teacher should like put it in you could do that so having some sort of like um pointers really does help but in addition i'd say um there is a section where you can uh, you can submit additional letters of recommendation and here you can really have a variety so don't really it's not only teachers for example if you volunteered at an organization you can have someone at that organization write your recommendation letter if you've done an internship for example so having a variety of letters or you know, maybe it can be a principal. So having different people, if you have an, a section for an additional letter, you know, it's really good to have something additional, and a recommendation about you from multiple perspectives, because I believe different people would have different views on you and you, they could highlight things about you that really would stand out to officers. And I'd say another thing is in addition to a recommendation letter, for some university colleges would ask for a resume. So if you can submit that as well, to just highlight more things that would not be in your activity list would be helpful as well. Yeah, over. Amazing. Um, I'm now going to open it up to the rest of our panelists if they have anything else they'd like to add for letters of recommendation. All right, great. And now moving on to our next question. What is a mistake that you or a friend that you know that you would recommend others avoid in their application process? And I'll start this off with Jayla. Uh, one mistake that I made was I kept pushing off the little personal little questions that they ask during the application process. So each college, they have little questions that you have to answer. And like they could be like really dumb questions, but you still have to answer them. And I would always push them off because I'm like, there'd be like 500 words max. And I don't want to write 500 words. I already wrote a 650 word essay about myself. Why would I want to write more words? So I always push them off. And then that would like, and that was like the, the main part of the essay that I had to complete. Because everything else was like already like quick, easy. You put it in, you're done. 
but like the personal questions always took the longest time for me because I was always pushing them off because I was always procrastinating. Like, I don't want to do that. But then I was like, wait, if I keep pushing them off, I'm going to end up not finishing in time for like my early action deadline, which was November, November 1st. So that was my mistake. I'd always, I always procrastinate and then I end up realizing that I didn't finish them. And then when I went to that, like, submit my application, I had to go back and finish them, which add more work and more time into my process because I'm like, I should have done it when I was doing my application in the first place instead of waiting and procrastinating. So mine was procrastinating my applications and like finishing right when I was doing it. And that was like the biggest mistake I could have made because then I'd have to rush to submit them before my deadline. Yeah, a lot of things can definitely sneak up on you. So I definitely understand that. And then moving on to Doreen, if there's any mistakes that you or other international students that you might have known of made during the cycle that you'd like to let everyone else know about. Okay, so I would agree with Jayla in terms of, you know, the essays that you, the tiny essays that you have to write. So like actually starting early and not really like procrastinating them and leaving them to the last minute. Because I do remember for one of like the colleges that I was applying to, I think the deadline was like, Around two days before the deadline, that's when I actually started the essay. It turned out great, but then I'd say if I had more time to actually put in the work and the effort into the essay, it would have been much better. But I'd say, like, you know, not leaving it to, like, the last minute because they can be a lot. For some colleges, they can ask up to five questions, and they're quite short, like 50 words, 100, 250. So, you know, starting early with that. But another thing I'd say, applying to colleges that you actually want to go to, because, of course, if you diversify your list, maybe you have some safeties. So if you have safeties just for the sake of putting them there and not really wanting to apply, um, not really wanting to attend to those schools, but you just apply to them. At the end, if maybe if that remains the choice that you have, you might be a bit, little bit disappointed because so I'd say like, you know, actually choosing the places you want to go to. And another thing is, especially as an international student, is during the financial aid process, usually on Common App, which is the platform that you use to apply to the universities, they do ask a question, are you planning to apply for financial aid? Yes or no. And for many universities, they list that if you say no, then it's hard for you to apply for financial aid later on. So like keeping track of like, the process of applying for financial aid, because if you would know, then it might be a bit tricky for you to apply for financial aid later on. And let's say, say again, on the um, term of like deadlines, for some colleges, they have like interviews that you can do, you know, just as an addition to your ap um, application. So it's quite advisable to do interviews if that's something that you'd like, but also knowing the deadlines for those interviews so don't, you don't really miss that on, out on them. So, yeah. All right, thank you so much. I'd like to open it up to anyone else to speak. Also, I see, Jail, you have your hand up. So if you would like to go again, also, please feel free. Um, something that Doreen reminded me of when she said financial aid was that even though schools, they offer scholarships. Even if a school offers scholarships, do not think you don't need to apply for any other outside scholarships. That's a mistake that I made was thinking, oh, they gave me money? I don't need to apply for anything else. But yes, you do. You can always get more money because them, them school, the school debt, um, the school loans and stuff, like the money that you have, need to pay can hit you like a tow truck. And you'd be like, I didn't know I had to pay that much money. So making the mistake of not applying to more scholarships is horrible. Like I, like even now I'm over here, like rushing to apply for scholarships because I didn't apply for enough and I'm paying the price now. So I'm just make sure you apply to a scholarship. Even if you get a lot of money from your school, especially for out of state people, Apply for scholarships outside of your school because you you will need, the, the need that money. All right. And I'll open this up to anyone else if they have any mistakes that either you or a friend made that you would like to let everyone know. Awesome. And that is a great conversation to segue into our next question. This one will